Time for, for a second round. Um, Senator Sharon Keoghan, you're next. Thank you, uh, Acting Chair. And um, I'm sorry I missed uh, Elaine. I missed your statement this morning. I was late coming in uh, due to a hospital appointment. Um, but I have to say I want to thank you all for your personal journeys, sharing those statements with us, the compassionate statements, heartbreaking evidence that you've given here today. And I really, really appreciate you sharing that. Now, I am probably one of the dissenters, and I wholeheartedly um, um, object to the commercialisation of um, the human child and the regulation of women uh, to the status of simply incubators or wombs for hire, irrespective of uh, whether you're heterosexual, uh, single, lesbian, gay or trans. Uh, surrogacy, I believe, is harmful, it's exploitative, and it's unethical. I don't believe it is everyone's right to have a child. It is a privilege to give birth, and it can be dangerous, even to, even to those with the best medical attention. So I have a couple of questions that I would like to ask. Why do you think most European countries do not allow commercial surrogacy? So that's the first one. The second question is, why do you think the High Court in Spain very recently said commercial surrogacy constitutes unacceptable exploitation of both child and biological mother? The same court, the court, the commercial surrogacy is against international treaties like the Convention on the Rights of the Child and the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. While some may say that mothers do not identify themselves as mothers to these children, would you not agree it is vital that these women be recognised on the birth certs in some way? It is, not, is it not in the best interest of the child through surrogacy? Is it not better to include or acknowledge the birth cert, uh, their surrogate mother, in order to honour the entirety of the identity of the child? We shouldn't whitewash or airbrush uh, birth mothers out of the process. And it is about regulation. And I suppose if we've learned anything about the mother and baby home scenario, where literally people were trying to find out who they were, where they came from, and they couldn't do that. It, regulate, I want to see this regulated. Believe me, I would like to see this regulated. But it is so important that we don't airbrush and whitewash the birth mother out of the process. So maybe you can answer some of those queries for me. Thank you. Thanks, Senator. Um, Elaine, do you want to di direct the questions? Um, and I'm also just conscious about Selena that you're not in the room. So if you <coughs> want to indicate um, through Teams, you know, the, the hand up signal or whatever, and we and or just give a wave and I'll bring you in, okay? In case I, I leave you out. Thank you. Um, before I get into answering the question, I'd like to just make a kind of a contribution around use of language um, and its impact. Um, I think it's really important that you as committee members think about your responsibility to lead the debate in a respectful, dignified uh, way around surrogacy. Um, inflammatory language um, and undefined, using undefined um, terms don't benefit the debate. Our members are ordinary people who have in some cases been through harrowing experiences. We're doing our best to be good parents to our much-loved children. We are Irish citizens, your constituents, and you are our representatives. Having lived through and experienced Ireland's journey towards marriage equality in 2015, as a member of the LGBT plus community, I can tell you that words matter. Your words here matter and have impact. And while I celebrated when Ireland said yes, I also suffered what that referendum campaign brought and what words brought. Public debates and discourse, inflammatory language on whether people like me were worthy, whether we mattered, whether we could be trusted. Speeches, articles, poster campaigns, ads displaying families like mine as something to be feared and something that was wrong and shameful. Inflammatory language that just stokes fear and mistrust. I'm thankfully living a wonderful life with my wife and daughter. I'm thankful Ireland said yes. 
but I bear the scars of that debate. And people here today and listening today and engaging in this wider discourse will bear the scars of that language. So, and you will, you will have noticed today and in the last, last couple of weeks, heightened kind of discourse around the prejudice that the LGBT community faces. Hate sorry, crimes. Sorry, could you answer the question, please? I will, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. She's entitled to respond to so, your inflammatory com language. Com committees are a place for a debate. If there is no critical thinking and questioning, we could write the report now. Critical with no, thinking with no, does with not no excuse voice inflammatory and okay, okay, okay. 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 Hang on, everybody, hang on, hang on. I mean, there's one person chairing the meeting, okay? Thank you. Now, I've I would ask question. everybody, okay, Senator, but it is not appropriate to interrupt the witness, okay? I said at the start of the meeting that there was adequate time for people, so I'm allowing people to go over time, okay? It's okay, not inappropriate you, to interrupt. Allow the lady to speak. Thank you. I don't want anybody to, di to be disrespectful to our witnesses, and I would ask all members, everyone is entitled to their own views and their own opinions on this, but do be mindful of your language, do be respectful, and certainly I will not be standing over a meeting where we have any sort of disrespect to witnesses that are in this room, okay? Well said. Well said. Thank you. Continue, please, Elaine. The point I'm making is actions that happen, prejudicial actions and harm that happens in our community all start with words. So words matter. We are sharing deeply personal stories and your words here matter. Thank you for your questions, Senator. Um, in terms of um, the European cases um, and Span the Spanish uh, High Court um, finding, I'll pass over to my colleague, Claire. Um, Senator, I'm very sorry to say, I'm not aware of the specific uh, circumstances around that case, but I suppose very respectfully, I do want to take somewhat issue with, um, I suppose, the suggestion that you don't believe that everyone has a right to parent a child. Um, Obviously, you have your role here, but the Irish courts disagree with you, as does the European Court of Human Rights, under which we have international obligations to adhere to, you know. So Article 8, which is respects the right to private and family life for all individuals, um, would, would disagree with you in that regard. The, I suppose the other thing I would say is that I think it's important to define what you mean by commercialisation, do you know, because... There's been, uh, you know, I've, I've been listening into the committee over the last few weeks and I've been so grateful to the contributions of uh, Senator Kearney and Senator Ruan and especially the commentary around exploitation and what it means in the context of commercialisation or a payment of money, a figure. I think it's so important not to presume that the payment or the remuneration or the compensation of a woman for her time and her effort and her sacrifice in many ways over nine months of her life in terms of her work, her family life, everything that she got, gives up, the morning sickness alone, you know? Like, I, I, <laughs> I think that it's, it would be incredible. I, I, I can't understand a process in which we wouldn't recognise that massive sacrifice and contribution to the lives of everyone here, you know? So um, I, I suppose if you wouldn't mind, if you could define commercialisation, we'd be happy to answer more questions. Well, commercialisation is when... Uh, when um, I suppose couples engage in a contract where they pay the surrogate mother money to carry the, the child. And so, so what I would say in response to that is that I imagine, and from the submissions of all of my colleagues here, is that they have engaged in surrogacy whereby there may have been payments or not, they can speak to that themselves. But I suppose the most important thing is that that woman would have made that decision. She would have made that decision with informed consent, with uh, counselling perhaps, and any system that we're proposing as a coalition would include principles that look to have an ethical framework. And that includes counselling, that includes legal advice, and making sure that you know, there is no such exploitation, which I think is a very harmful presumption, do you know? Why do you think that, um, um, why do you think it's allowed in countries, or it's okay for, let's say, women in Ukraine, but it's not okay for women in Ireland. It should be okay for women in Ireland. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I think that's yeah. why we're here. <laughs> we, so let's, I agree with Sharon, yeah. let's introduce it for women in Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> no. 
That's where I'm at. But, you know, why do you think you're, some of European countries don't allow commercial sur surrogacy? I, I, I'm so sorry. I'm so conscious. I'm taking up all the time. Yeah. Um, I might let my other colleagues come in. But what I would just say as well is to clarify that there are many countries that don't regulate for surrogacy, which is a different thing to say that they don't allow for it. But I'm sorry. I'm taking up too much time. Okay. And the issue of the birth parent, the birth uh, mother being on the birth cert, does anybody want to address that? I'll happily address it. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'll address your two points just in relation to <coughs> European countries that don't allow it. As my colleague have said, it's not in many cases that they don't allow it, they just don't regulate for it. Okay. I would say that through my eight years of the journey to parenthood, I met lots of parents from countries in <coughs> Europe where <coughs> international surrogacy was either forbidden or made very difficult by the legislation and by the processes in place in their countries. But it didn't solve the problem in those countries. Those parents still found ways to parenthood in other locations. I met them on the journey. So as you were told yesterday by the representatives from the legal profession in the UK, not allowing it, banning it, making it difficult just does not work. It just means that people find alternative ways and they're left to their own devices. What we're asking for is a framework that supports people to make ethical decisions in the interest of a child in the interest of a surrogate and in the interest of an intended parent and in that order. I would also say that in terms of your point about recognition on the birth cert, I'll speak for myself and my, the organisation that I represent. We have no issue whatsoever with a birth cert incorporating the details of a surrogate mother. I want my children to know exactly where they came from. You mentioned mother and baby homes. I'm, I'm not sure that's appropriate because in those cases, those children were denied information about their lineage, about yeah. their heritage. None of us sitting here today have wanted that for our children. I'm already talking to my three and a half year old twins about where they came from, in an, as, as my colleague here mentioned, in an age appropriate way. So whether it's on the birth cert or not, yeah. parents want their children to know. We have contact with our egg donor. She's also part of our kids' story. And their kid, yeah. you know, so nobody here is trying to whitewash, as you yeah. mentioned, people out of the picture. Actually, what no, we're trying UK, to... No, in the UK, uh, it Can it I just finish my point? Yeah, sorry. Nobody's trying to whitewash people out of the picture. What we're actually trying to do is set up a framework that will make sure they can never be taken out of the picture. Well, I'm glad to hear that. And thank you for clarifying that. Thank you. Um, Selena, I see you have your hand raised if you want to come in as well. Thanks. Thank you. Just very briefly in answer to uh, the centre's question about why Ireland and why other countries have not gone through this process yet. Uh, I'd just like to point out that it's not unusual for Ireland to lead the way, particularly from a legislative or a human rights or equality point of view. Uh, the Americans' human rights and equality uh, part of their constitution was based on Bonacna Heron and what we did. Um, we have a, a right to Irish Sign Language since 2017 in this country, whereas the UK are only starting to have that discussion now. Um, so why not let Ireland continue to be leaders of good practice and equality and human rights? We've done it before. We're respected for it. Thanks, Lena. Anybody else? Uh, Kira. Can I just come in as well? So, um, Senator, thank you for your questions and for... Um, explain to us what your beliefs are. Um, I suppose your beliefs are not what I've experienced, and I am the lived experience. I've gone through the process, um, done every single little piece of research that I can possibly do to ensure that it is an ethical process that I have gone through. Um, when you talk about whitewashing um, our surrogate, it, it, it's difficult to explain to you, but you know, I speak to my children every day about uh, their surrogate mother. They know who she is. They know who she, you know. Uh, hopefully, she, they will meet soon. You know, we hope that we will have days out together and that. But just obviously, we live in different countries, so COVID has prevented that over the last couple of years. But she is very much included in our lives every day. We honour her every day. You know, there's photographs of her. They see photographs of her. They see photographs of her children, her family. So she's part of our life every day. So I'm actually, to be honest, I, I know it's your belief, but it's actually can be slightly insulting um, to me and to my colleagues, uh, because I suppose in Irish families through surrogacy, it is a common approach that that's what we would do with our children. You know, our children know where they come from. They know who their surrogate mother is. You know, they know that um, 
that we didn't carry them in our tummy. We have to explain it to them in an age-appropriate way, like Mammy's tummy was broken. Um, you know, this very kind lady, I'm not, I'm not naming her here publicly, mm -hmm. but this very kind lady helped Mammy, you know? Thank you. I mean, yeah. because as, as, a, as a foster parent for 12, 13 years, I would have gone through the similar red tape that you would have gone, gone through, so I understand it perfectly, uh, particularly when you have a non-consenting parent, and I empathise with that.